with you guys ready to, for Bible study this morning? Good. We uh, here at the Alpine Chapel, um, we just go through books of the Bible. And so we've been in the book of Genesis now for a couple months and uh, the book of beginnings. And it's been great, man, learning about creation and what God has done. And, and in, a, in a day when people are really challenging uh, all of that. It's been, uh, it's been really, really good. And so um, if you don't feel that way, then just keep that to yourself. Um, I recognize that each and every week there's probably 80% of you out here that are visiting. And so it's interesting to be going verse by verse. And when you come in and you visit, uh, it's a little different because we're building on what God has done. We're starting chapter six of Genesis today, and I will tell you that the first four verses are some of the most controversial verses in the entire Bible. A lot of division and uh, debate has come about because of these four verses that we're uh, studying today. And I brought them up just a tad last week, and boy, did I get hit with emails. Um, it was awesome. It's been a really fun week. Um, most people were very kind all over the nation, people that watch and, and were just blessed by that. And, and they were very, you know, behind, you know, they said, man, that was great. Pastor Michael, never, never heard anybody say anything like that. And, and we're so grateful for that. But uh, there was a few that wrote uh, to me and were disappointed. They said, boy, we, we are a little disappointed in uh, what you said and, uh, they let me know that they had studied more than I had studied. And so anyway, praise the Lord. It's wonderful to uh, preach and put it online. <laughs> yeah, so, so I thought, you know, I just barely touched on it. I thought, let's really dive into it and take a lot of people off. So <laughs> if you're visiting, I'm so sorry, and uh, God bless you. Anyway. I got a few things on my heart. Today's going to be a little bit personal for me, and um, a dog just walked into church. That's great. Excellent, man. It's awesome. Maybe that dog will go to heaven. That'd be great. Today's going to be, today's going to be a little bit of a personal message for me. I'm going to share some things from my heart, and uh, and, and a little bit bear myself out there a little bit more than I normally have, just because of what I've been kind of going through, not just this week, but over the last month. I am, I am learning that to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ means a couple things. Uh, one of them is that people look at you, and not just as a pastor or as a leader, but I think as Christians, people are watching us, you guys. <laughs> They're watching to see if we really believe this stuff that we say that we believe. And I think it's a day where people, you know, they, they might show up to a church on Sunday and they might nod their heads and they might agree, but then they have to go to work in the real world during the week. And it becomes really, it's becoming harder and harder and harder to be someone who stands up in this culture and says, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. And I would lay my life down for him. To be a person that someone looks at, that looks maybe even up to, is a sort of a double-sided coin, uh, a two-edged sword, if I can say it that way. In one sense, it's very honoring, and it's a blessing. In the other sense, it's a little scary that people would look at you uh, and me. And I think this is very much the case for people that might be in leadership in the Christian world, pastors and evangelists and, and, and things like that. And, the, and the, the biggest thing is this, is that for many Christian leaders, they can become a replacement for Jesus in people's minds. And it should not be that way, okay? I'm calling this today, who is on the pedestal? And it's a question that I've been asking myself, you know, recently. Who's on the pedestal here? Obviously, as a Christian, Jesus is on the pedestal. There's the end of the sermon. I just told you. <laughs> but, but the problem is, is that for many of us, we have people that have spoken into our lives, people that have mentored us or, or that we have looked up to, and we can tend to put them on what I'm calling the pedestal today, and, and the problem is, is like only one person fits on the pedestal. So if you have more than one person on the pedestal, 
what tends to happen is that Jesus sort of topples. Jesus gets pushed off, and it shouldn't be that way. Nobody should take the place of Jesus in our lives. And because I am a Jesus follower, and because you are a Jesus follower, follower, everybody would agree with what I'm saying. Everybody would say, yeah, of course, Jesus is on the pedestal. But what's been happening over the last 50 years in the church, especially if you've been a Christian for in, during the 70s and the 80s, and we've seen these televangelists and these big-time Christians have fallen. They're stealing money from the church, or they're sleeping with their secretaries or whatever, and, and then that happens, and the, and the church blows up or divides or whatever, and then you're seeing people saying, you know what? shine all of this, man. I'm out. If this is what Christianity is, and if that guy or that lady can fall, then I can't do it. I have a nephew that's like this. You know, his pastor blew up down in Colorado Springs, church of 15,000 people, was having an affair. It's a big deal. You probably remember about it. I remember it, um, New Life Church. And my nephew was going there, and, and as soon as that happened, he was serving in the church. He was a huge part of it. And and uh, when that happened, he said, forget it. He walked away from not just church, but the Lord for eight years. Thank the Lord he's come back. But you know what the, the issue was with my, my nephew? Is he didn't have Jesus on the pedestal. He had that pastor on the pedestal. And you know, most, most leaders don't ask, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! Anyway. I can boost it. <laughs> have you really? Because we were freaking out. Reggie's in front of you going. I'm about my hair. <laughs> nice. Nice. You know, most Christian leaders would never ask to be put on a pedestal. I say most because I think there probably are some that like, like the attention. But for the most part, nobody asks to be put on a pedestal. We want Jesus to be on the pedestal. Um, but it happens. So recently, this has been something that I've been really personally struggling with, and I, I want to share you with that. Now, I, now, we're here in these very controversial passages of Scripture, and you're, you, when we read them, you're going to think, how in the world does that relate to being put on the pedestal, and, and what are you talking about? And that's because there's a personal thing that I want to share with you. But, but first of all, let me just tell you this. Whenever somebody reads Scripture... And they just take one part, for instance, Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and they take those scriptures out of context. It can be very dangerous. You understand what I'm saying? We must be reading the Bible in context with understanding of, of the entire story. You don't just take one little scripture and then make a doctrine out of it. Does that make sense? So I'm going to put a paragraph up here on the screen, and I just want you to think about this if it makes sense to you, okay? This is not from the Bible. No longer do you need to fear the evil Shelob. Her hypnotizing presence is weakened significantly by the file of Galadriel. Although the wickedness of Sauron still builds in the east, your mission is to carry the treasure to Mount Doom, uh, to Mount Doom is secure. And as long as you cling to the sting and wisely use the glittering file, you will be safe. Keep following Smeagol for now and make your way past Sirith Ungol. Now, if you've read J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, maybe that makes sense to you or seen the movies, right? Okay. So some of you, you might see that and you're like, it kind of brings back some memories and like, wow, there's a sense of wonder, like, oh, Smeagol, you know? And, and that's very interesting. Now, if you've never read the 1,085-page trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, or seen the movies, you've never done that, and you read that, dude, you're lost. What's a Smeagol? What's a Sting? What's the file of Galadriel or whatever? I don't care how many times you read this paragraph. It's never going to make sense to you if you don't know the context. You could be in a prison cell. Someone could rip out this paragraph on page from a book, hand it to you and say, here you go, read this for the next 10 years. You could read it a billion times. Now, you may come up with all kinds of weird ideas of what it means, and you come up with some weird doctrine. But the truth is, if you've never known the story, the Lord of the Rings, this will never make sense to you. Are you guys with me here? Okay, now here's the deal. Sometimes I think the Bible's like that. Sometimes people will come in and, you know, they'll hear a sermon or whatever and they'll read part of the Bible and it's just like gibberish. 
It's like, what? This doesn't even make sense. It's because you got to understand the whole story. You have to take things uh, in, in the in the context that they were meant to be in. So again, I made reference to these scriptures last week and heard a lot of people that were excited and then a few people who were absolutely not excited and all of that. So are you ready to read these scriptures? Oh, Lord, help us. Okay, here we go. Some of you are like, man, what in the world are these scriptures? You're so excited. That was the greatest introduction I've ever heard. All right, verse 1 of chapter 6. When mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever, because they are corrupt, and their days will be 120 years. Here's the big one, verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth, both in those days and afterward. And when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind, who were children, uh, they bore children to them. They were the powerful men of old, the famous men. Okay. (laughs) I have spent spent a lot of time uh, really pouring into this passage, praying over it, studying it as much as I possibly can. And I will tell you, my brain's a little bit on overload. It's a little bit ready to explode here. Um, But what's so controversial about this? Let me kind of break it down. Today's a little bit more deep. It's more of a Bible study. You got to put your thinking caps on. You guys with me? Okay, just for another four and a half hours. Um, (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. The Hebrew word that is translated Nephilim in this passage, by the way, can I just say this? You only see that word twice in the Old Testament. One, another time is when the spies were going to spy out the promised land and they went in there and uh, 10 out of 12 of them saw the Nephilim, it's mentioned, and they became so scared that it kept them from entering in, okay? So, and then so it's, there, it's that instance and then right here. Um, but the word Nephilim in Hebrew has uh, a bunch of different definitions. I'm gonna put them up here on the screen for you. It can mean giants, it can mean mighty men, It can mean fallen ones, heroes, fierce warriors, and I thought this one was interesting, bullies, okay? Now, the Hebrew language sometimes can be a little bit confusing when you're translating into English because there's so many different translations to that word, okay? You guys with me? So a lot of times what people will do is they'll take the one definition that sort of meets their belief system, and they'll use that. But the truth is, there's many times multiple definitions. These mighty men, these giants, whatever they are, uh, were legendary figures spoken of in many different cultures uh, that we see throughout history and different types of writings and things like that. But where did these Nephilim, where did these giants come from is the big question. And there are basically two schools of thought. Okay, and, I'm, and I talked very slightly about them last week and made people mad. So let me go into a little bit more detail. Two schools of thought, where did these Nephilim come from? The first school of thought is this. They, uh, scholars basically suggest that the, when it says the daughters of man or the daughters of mankind, that that refers to the daughters of Adam. And that refers to human women, okay? They also suggest that when it says the sons of God, that that refers to the angels or the fallen angels. So the first school of thought is this. This is the idea that when Satan was cast out of heaven uh, with one third of the angels came with him, that some of those angels actually came to earth, had sexual relations with human women, And the offspring from that produced these Nephilim, these mighty giants or whatever they they were. Okay, now that's the first school of thought. I will be honest with you, I have never ascribed to that school of thought, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. To me, it sounds like really Greek mythology. You know, we got, you know, the angelic realm, uh, you know, having relations with human people as a pastor today, what am I supposed to do with that? Do I, hey, if you're a lady here today, we just keep your prayer life up because you got to be careful. Sometimes demons will come down and you'll be sleeping and they'll just impregnate. What? (laughs) 
Like, I mean, listen, if it happened here, does it still happen today? Is there a Bible verse that says, okay, that stopped happening. God said, okay, that's a no-no, demons, don't do that. Where do we get this? So I've never bought into this. I think it's a joke, really. I can't believe people believe it. That's how I've always felt. But here's the second school of thought, okay? And that is this, that daughters of men, or the daughters of mankind, translated here, refers to the descendants of Cain, okay? Cain and that lineage of people sort of did not follow the ways of God. And that the sons of God is in the lineage of Seth. Okay, and Seth, those were the people that sort of acknowledged the Lord and, and uh, followed after him. So the, the second school of thought basically is this, that, that the, the, the godly ones, the godly men who were going after God and they were known their family lineage was going after God, that they sort of met these women who were of the world uh, on the wrong side of the tracks we're attracted to them, and you know what we would say today in the, in the modern day? We would say they were unequally yoked. Does that make sense? Christian with a non-Christian. A God follower with a non-God follower. So this is sort of how we would talk today uh, in this idea. Now, these two theories have caused all kinds of division and all kinds of debate, and they're both based on this Verse, verse four, these four verses really. And I kid you not when I tell you that people are passionate about this teaching. I had no idea. And uh, I mean, they are really serious about it. And, and, I, and I'm not kidding when I tell you that I have really done a lot of study. I, I, I'd be lying if I, if I were to tell you that I'm not sitting up here today uh, with a little bit of fear and trepidation to bring this message to you um, this idea of demons sleeping with women is crazy to me that people actually believe that. But I've done a lot of study. And just to kind of give you an idea, I'm going to put up on screen here all the books that I looked at. And so I know you can't read all that, but there's a lot. Some of these are very, very good. Some of them on the, on the right are Bibles that I looked at, commentaries and things. So I really tried to do my due diligence. You might say, Michael, why in the world would you study so much about a weird passage? Why don't we just talk about Jesus dying on the cross and, and how much we, you know, why do we have to do this kind of stuff? I think it's really important because, well, first of all, because we live in a culture where people are asking us questions. And a lot of Christians don't have good answers. <laughs> well, I just have faith and I love God. Okay, but what about this? And where did the Nephilim come from? It's so crazy that people that don't even give a rip about God will ask that question. Well, where did the Nephilim come from? This is a big one. But really the reason that I do so much study, gang, is a little verse that, that's found in 2 Timothy that Paul, when he was talking to a young pastor, he said this. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. Let me tell you, I take this verse very, very seriously. The Bible tells us in um, another place that, that not many of you should presume to be teachers. Basically, my translation is that if you presume to be a teacher, you will be held to a higher standard. So you shouldn't presume that. You, you shouldn't really want that unless God's called you to it. So I take this very, very seriously. And by the way, look at that first line. Be diligent to present yourself to a congregation in Telluride. No. When I preach, and there may be people listening, but really I'm preaching to an audience of one. If I make you mad... I'm sorry. I'm doing my best to be approved to, to the Lord. Does that make sense? I stand before him, and I, and I want to be able to do so unashamedly, and that's why I spend time studying like this. It doesn't mean that I'm always right. It doesn't, um, but it is. I, I just think all too often that when we read the Bible, it can seem like J.R.R. Tolkien seems to people who have never read his books or, or seen the movies. So often we, we talk to people or we have people explain, like you've seen this, right? Like where you've not seen a movie and then your friend is like, oh, you gotta see this movie, dude. It's awesome. And so they'll tell you about the movie and they tell you all about the movie and you're like, man, it's okay, that does sound really good, but you just ruined it for me. Like, why do I need to see it now? Thanks a lot. Anybody ever had that happen? How many of you have your wife do that to you, like, consistently? <laughs> oh, just, okay, all right. Um, here's the danger. When someone tells you about a movie, you take, they, they take the risk of, of you miss things, right? You're missing out. You, you, 
if someone, if all you ever do is come to a church like this and listen to some guy talk about the Lord and he's telling you what he thinks about the Bible and that's all you ever do, here's the danger. The danger is what if that dude's wrong? What if he gets it wrong? You know, Paul told in Acts chapter 17, we see that Paul is commending a group of people called the Bereans. You know why? Because after he preached, they would go home and they would search the scriptures and say, is what that guy said really true? Let me check that out here. And he commended them. He's like, that's awesome that you guys are looking at the scriptures. You're not just taking what you hear on the radio or what some guy on a stage tells you. Danger. Also, the danger is missing, missing out on maybe what God can be doing in you during the journey, during the times of study, okay? So listen, after reading this numerous, numerous times, praying about this particular passage and being really scared to stand in front of you guys or sit on a stool because I twisted my knee, I, I went to do what I normally do, and I study. I pull out all these books, and I have all these helps and, and things like that. So the first thing I do is I, I like to look at other Bible people that I respect, and I look at their, they're called commentaries. And they just write, they read the Bible, and they write about what they write. So I have a bunch, uh, I mean, over 25 probably. But I have three that are my favorites, and, or that I go to all the time. And these are guys that I go to, hey, what do they say about this? You know, I respect them. And so the first one I went to was a guy named Chuck Missler. And I was talking to some folks today who actually know who that is. That's pretty great. Um, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. So, uh, but I love you guys. I'm glad you're here. Um, but I want to be approved by God. So I, I read Chuck Missler, and I'm going to put a quote. This is right out of his commentary. Listen to this. It says, the understanding of this passage hangs on the Hebrew term that has been translated sons of God, which is benai ha elohim. In the Old Testament, this term refers exclusively to angels, okay? Now, the word that stands out to me there is exclusively, because I read that, and I was like, holy cow, sons of God, that to me, exclusively means only that, right? So, I was like, well, that's crazy. That's interesting. I'm looking at someone else I respect. So, I went to a guy named Chuck Smith, and Chuck Smith, I, you know, he, awesome Bible teacher, went to be with Jesus recently and, uh, or a few years ago. And Chuck Smith said the same thing. He emphatically took the, de the demon position, okay? Now, after that, I went to my all-time favorite commentator. This guy has been a mentor to me for 30 years. He doesn't even know my name. When I was in college, I met him, and I got on his, uh, remember cassette tapes? <laughs> there were these little things he put in your car. Anyway... I was on, uh, his name's John Corson, John Corson's cassette tape of the, of the week, and he would mail it to me, and I would listen to him, and he mentored me. He doesn't even know it. So I love John Corson. I went to his commentary. I'm going to put a quote from his commentary. It says this, the phrase sons of God is benai elohim. Every time benai elohim appears in the Old Testament, it is in reference to angels. Now, I got to tell you, right then, I was disturbed. I, personal thing, but I'm like, whoa. I have really thought this was a whacked out idea, but these three guys that I respect more than anybody else uh, all say, you know, exclusively every time it refers to angels. And, and if that's the case, if these guys say it, it's case closed for me. Like I'm gonna have to, even though I'm uncomfortable, I'm gonna have to deal with this idea that demons somehow came to the planet and impregnated women, as weird as that may sound. Now, Remember what the text says. I'm going to put it up here again. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them. They were the powerful men of old, the famous men. Now, again, I firmly believe that you have to look at the original languages and you have to read things in context. How could all the people like me previously who believed in the Seth line believe it if Guys like these are saying, hey, every time Benai Elohim is used, it's always in reference, exclusively in reference, every time in reference to these angels. I mean, who else could make an argument for that? So I started looking at all the people, Bible scholars that I respect, guys like Matthew Henry, Dr. Michael Brown, um, Hank Hennegraaff, different guys that, uh, you know, that I've, I've listened to and read in the past. And I started looking at these guys. They all believe in the Seth Line view. And, uh, and none of them mentioned that Benai Elohim is only mentioned in reference to angels. And I thought, why are these guys skipping this? This is a big deal. 
I don't understand. So I, I know this is a little bit boring, you guys, but you got to, and for me, this was a huge honking mama deal. Okay? And then thank the good Lord, I went outside of commentaries. And I opened up uh, my little interlinear Old Testament book. And it's very small. You have to have bifocals to read the lines. It has all the lines in the Bible. And above every word is a number. And you look the number up in my keyword study uh, book, and uh, it tells you the Hebrew or whatever. So all this is boring probably, but let me just tell you, above sons of God was a little number. So I looked up that number. Sure enough, it means benai Elohim. I looked that up in my keyword thing, and it gives you all the instances that it's used. And guess what I found out? Benai Elohim only about 50% of the time refers to angels. The other 50% of the time, it refers to those who are following after God. And I'm going to give you some examples, but you're not going to remember all these. But if you're a note taker or you're watching online, uh, you know, you can write these down. Deuteronomy 14.1, Deuteronomy 32.5, Psalm 73.15. Uh, there's a bunch. I'm going to read one to you. This is in Hosea. The book of Hosea, probably a lot of you were reading this this morning before you came to church. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Listen to this verse, Hosea 1, 10. I don't have it up here, sorry. Yet the number of Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or counted. And in the place where they were told, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. Benai ha Elohim is what that is in Hebrew. Does that sound like it's talking about demons to you? No, it doesn't. And all of a sudden, I started looking in these, and I got to tell you, I became really concerned. Three of the greatest mentors and teachers in my life got it wrong, gang. They got it wrong. I don't mind that they have their opinion. That's fine. But don't tell me exclusively and every time when it's not exclusively and every time. Are you guys with me? And, uh, and so I've been dealing with this now for a few weeks. And it's really shook me. And I was thinking, why is this shaking me so much? And I realized, because I've got some of these people on a pedestal. And it ain't right. My favorite guys can get it wrong. That verse, you guys, let me tell you, the two schools of thought, I'll put it up here. This is how they can be identified. Okay, the first school of thought the, and, and this is Michael's interpretation here, using these exact words, looking at them. The giants were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And when the demons came and had sexual relations with the daughters of men, they bore children to them. That's the first way you can read this, okay? The second way is the fierce warrior bullies were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And when those that followed God came and had relations with the daughters of those who don't follow God, they bore children to them. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Both of these interpretations could be true if you look at the original language. They both could be accurate, but there's no way that both of them are accurate. Does that make sense? Only one of them can be right. I have learned enough now to know that you never take one scripture out of context and build an entire doctrine upon it. You got to look at the rest of scripture. So what does the rest of scripture say? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you guys are good question askers. Okay? Here, what is, you go back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. You read again. We have already studied this. But you read again and again and again that when God was creating the animals, creating human, he made them. You see this line, according to their kinds, according to their kinds, according to their kinds. What does that mean? It means that we don't mate elephants with dogs. Like it doesn't work out, okay? It's weird looking. It wouldn't even work, okay? You, it's according to their kinds. We don't intermix. So to me, you don't take human women and mate them, if I can say it that way, as crudely as it is, with spirit beings. You guys with me? It doesn't work. So there's that. In the New Testament, uh, Jesus is approached one time and these guys are trying to catch him, uh, these religious guys, and want to bust him up. And so they're like, hey, you know, so let's just say that this you know, um, guy or this woman marries a guy and he dies and then she marries his brother and then he dies and she marries his other brother and he dies. You guys remember this? 
It's like, you know, I don't know how many it is. Like, you know, she's married to 150 guys. And, and uh, so when she gets to heaven, uh, who's, whose wife will she be? Okay? This, listen to how Jesus answered these guys. It's so good. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30 says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they're like angels in heaven. Well, what does that mean? He says it again in Mark chapter 12. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They're like angels in heaven. They're like angels in heaven. They're not married. They don't have those types of relationships, I would say. Remember the time when Jesus comes out of the tomb, right? And he appears to everybody and they're like, wow, Jesus, you're alive, right? And then there's one of them that's not in the room. His name is Thomas, right? And Thomas was like, come on, guys. I don't know what you're smoking, but uh, Jesus ain't alive. You know, that's not... Come on, you know, you've been at the Telluride Mushroom Festival too long. <laughs> what? What did I say? Anyway, so Jesus appears right in the upper room, and Thomas is there, you know, and we call him Doubting Thomas because he didn't believe, right? And Jesus says this in Luke 24, 39. He says, look at my hands and my feet, Tom, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. Listen, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you can see that I have. What is Jesus saying? A sp- t- I'm not, it, spirits don't do this, is what he's saying. So gang, here's my official opinion. And I could be wrong, okay? And if you disagree with me, awesome. You could be wrong too. And, and it's just, it, I'm just being honest. I'm trying to give you both sides of the story and you can make your own decision, okay? But this is my official opinion and you're free to disagree. There were those who were in the godly line of Seth And they became attracted to some of the beautiful women that lived on the wrong side of town. And they had relations with them. And the offspring from them were a bunch of weird, freakish punks. That's my opinion. If you don't like me, I await your emails. That'd be great. (laughs) But I think the lesson for us today is twofold. The first one, I think, is this. And that is... I believe that this message is the first time in uh, the Torah, for sure, but in the whole Bible, it's the first time that we are warned about being unequally yoked. I think God is deadly serious about Christian people marrying other Christian people. Kelly and I have been doing this now for 32 years. We've done a lot of marital counseling, and I'm telling you, most of it stems from one person's in love with Jesus and the other person's not. It is hard to be linked or yoked with someone who is on a different path than you. And it can birth, if I can say it this way, destruction. It can birth freakish, bad, a theological term would be yucky (laughs) things. God's intending for the Christians to be linked and yoked. If you're single and you're listening to me, man, I'm telling you, I'm not just a guy who's saying, this is a naughty, naughty to date a non-Christian. I don't hear that. What I'm trying to say is, man, you will be better off. I promise you. I, you know, I think Kelly, my wife, loves me. <laughs> I hope so. I think she does. But you know, what, you know what I love about her is that she loves Jesus more than she loves me. She loves Jesus more, and I love Jesus more than I love her, and I think she's pretty groovy, (laughs) as Phil Collins would sing. So wait until you find someone who is head over heels in love with Jesus. I think that's the first lesson here, but the second lesson that God's been drilling into me recently is that I alone am responsible for my relationship with God. I must study and pray to show myself to be approved to God. Does that make sense? It's my relationship with God. I can't ride my, the, my parents' coattails into heaven. You can't ride your spouse's coattails into heaven. It is your relationship with God. And you cannot put anyone else on the pedestal. Only Jesus Christ. And I'm learning that I need to be a man who trusts in him and trusts in his word. And I've got to study it and learn it for myself. You know, for years and years and years, people just like you and people just like me would sit in churches sort of like this, usually much bigger cathedrals, and they would listen to a man preach a message in the Latin language. They would, the guy would read the Bible because it was only in Latin. None of the people spoke Latin except for the dude on stage. 
We call this period of history the Dark Ages. You know why? Because it was dark. Spiritually, it was dark. It was evil. You know why? Because some of the guys on stage started just, they knew that all these ignorant people don't know what I'm really saying. They can't read the Bible for themselves. And they were beginning to say things that the Bible, they said the Bible said, the Bible didn't say, but they were saying it for personal gain. How do you think they built these humongous cathedrals that we see over in England and stuff? How did they build them? They built them on the backs of people. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. I'm sorry. <laughs> False teaching because the people didn't know. Gang, do you understand? We live in a day where you have the Bible. I have an app on my phone, and it's got like 25 different translations in English of the Bible. He's like, well, I tried to read the Bible. It's really boring. Thou, theest, the." Then don't read that. King James. People say, well, what translation do you think is best? Any translation you'll read. How's that? <laughs> I mean, I can argue with you, and some of these are kind of weird, and they, I think they'd mess up. Just read something. I remember my, my sister told me one time that her husband, they, you know, they were Christians forever, and, uh, and he told me, he goes, I'm, I don't read the Bible. I'm like, what do you mean you don't read the Bible? You're like 35 years old. You've been in church your whole life. He goes, I don't think I've ever read the Bible. I'm like, why? And he goes, I don't understand it. It's like reading J.R.R. Tolkien. So my sister says, I don't know what to do. I go, buy him a New Living Translation. And I know Christians would say, well, the New Living Translation is really dangerous. I just buy it for him, see if he reads it. You know what he did? He called me three days later. He's like, have you ever read the book of Job? I was like, yeah, man, I have. He's like, it's awesome, man. Like, I've never read it. I just read the whole thing. It's so kicking cool, you know. So I always tell people, just buy whatever translation you read, man. But you got to get in. We are so blessed today that you can check the things that I say or your pastor at home says or the dude you listen to on the radio says because none of us are perfect. No one's perfect. No one deserves to be on the pedestal other than Jesus Christ. The, this guy that's been the greatest mentor to me, uh, pastor is a large church, and recently has sort of stepped back from pastoring and allowed his son to be the lead pastor. And so he's pastor emeritus or whatever. So he's still on staff. Well, after a few months, this young kid, 30-something, super handsome, great communicator. His son is unbelievable. Photographic memory. Uh, I would love to be a tenth as smart as him. Um, all these women in the church started coming out that he was having relations with these women. And um, so it got to be a big deal in that area. And uh, they called him in to, you know, deal with it because mouth of two or three witnesses, it was obvious. And uh, his dad, the guy that I so greatly respect, basically came out and said, um, we need to sweep this under the rug and not talk about it anymore. And, uh, and so they changed his son's title from being the lead pastor to being the hope generator. And that justified them not dealing with him and disciplining him like a pastor. He's just the hope generator. He can still go and speak. And so they allowed him to keep speaking. And now everything's blown up and it's bad. And I got to tell you, it's been happening now for about a month. I've been hurting because this guy, there's no one on the planet, no one that has meant, I would not be a pastor today if it weren't for this gentleman. And yet he's wrong. I have a son that's in ministry down right now. He's ministering to the children downstairs. And Connor loves Jesus, man. That's why we hired him. Not because he's my son. Because that dude loves Jesus. And, and I'm not even just saying that because I'm his dad. But I'll tell you, if it came out that Connor had messed up with a bunch of women or whatever, even one that was not his wife, I would not sweep it under the rug. I would stand up here in front of this church and I would say, I love my son. I'll always have his back. And, all, and God can forgive him. Amen? But he ain't ministering to our children anymore. He, is, he has to step down. He cannot be ministering to the youth of Telluride. That's not appropriate. Does that make sense? Because righteousness is even more important than my relationship with my son. And I would love him. You need to understand, I would love him. But he would not have that position anymore. So I don't, it's, it's been a big deal to me personally that this guy who's had such an impact on my life and I begin to realize, Michael, you've had that guy on a pedestal. This last year, we all learned about Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias was the greatest. He passed away. But after he passed away, all these women came out. 
And his own wife, God bless her, she said, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. We will shut this down. And she has totally dealt with integrity. But Ravi Zacharias was the greatest apologist that I've ever seen for the Bible, I mean, or heard. He is, was an unbelievable speaker. And now they will not play any of his teachings on the radio and stuff because he fell. He failed. That hurts guys that sat under that ministry. You with me? But God is trying to scream into our ears, at least mine. And if nobody else gets anything out of this, please know that I am. Um, he's trying to scream into our ears, don't you dare have anybody else on the pedestal except Jesus. And I'll close, gang, with this scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, that we've all heard, especially verse 2. But verse 1 says, therefore, therefore, pre you know, it, it, it's... It's after a whole chapter of all these incredible heroes of God's faith, right? So he says, because you have all these heroes that are just incredible rock stars, since we have all this, this large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us or entangles us. Let us run with endurance. In other words, don't give up on the race that you're running. I know it's hard, but don't give up. Run with endurance the race that lies before us. How do we do that? How do we not give up? Verse two, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Other translations say, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter. I like that, the author. Like if you wanna know how to live a Christian life, how about this? Go to the guy who wrote the book on it. Jesus, fix your eyes on him. He's the author, dude. He, you watch him and you won't get straight. See, this is what happens, right? We're, we become Christians and we're watching Jesus and then all of a sudden we start getting distracted by whatever, fill in the blank. People could put money on the pedestal. They could put their job on the pedestal. They could put a, a, a relationship on the pedestal. Their car on a pedestal, golf on a pedestal, their Harley Davidson motorcycle on a pedestal. Other teachers and pastors or evangelists on a pedestal. Whatever it is, we're over here and Jesus is like, hello, I'm over here, hello. And he, this, is, this is it right here, gang. We fix our eyes on Jesus. He will never let you down. I'm promising you right now, I promise you, I love Jesus, I am not faking it, Okay? And I love my wife, and I've been faithful to her for 32 years. I promise you that. I have never stepped out on her, ever. But I ain't perfect. And don't ever. And some of you are like, dude, we would never put you on a pedestal anyway. <laughs> We're just visiting, and we can't wait to get the heck out of here. So don't ever put any pastor, any leader, any spouse anyone ever on the pedestal other than Jesus Christ. We are to be those that fix our eyes on him. Amen? Amen. And, and lastly, let me just say this. Just like some of the, of the godly ones in our text and how they mixed it up with the daughters of, you know, they mixed it up with the people of the world, I think that's a warning for us too, the unequally yoked thing. But some of you are like, I'm already married and I'm yoked to this guy. Above and beyond that, spiritually, we must be people that don't mix it up with the world. Jesus says, I would rather you be hot on fire for me, obviously, or be freezing cold and don't give a rip about me. Like, I'd actually rather that than for you to be lukewarm where you have a foot in the Lord and a foot in the world and you're living this half life. You with me? He literally says, I'll spit you. I, the word is vomit. I will vomit you out of... Who wants to make God vomit? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great challenge? Hey, let's all go today. Hey, here's my challenge. Make God vomit. No. Don't be lukewarm, man. So don't let... Don't mix that up. God has called us to be separate and different from this world. Amen? And I think that's another little lesson here. Anyway, there's so much here, guys. I hope you got something out of it. Would you bow your hearts and let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I love you so much and I thank you for your word and the reminder, God, that you're the one that needs to be on the pedestal. Lord, men oftentimes will let us down, but you will never let me down. And so God, regardless of the people that keep falling or can, you know, whatever, 
that maybe we look up to or, or maybe they just make innocent mistakes, Lord. Even those three guys that I respect so much, I don't think they meant to lie or anything, God. But we make mistakes. We blow it. But you never do. And so, Father, I want to keep my eyes fixed on you as you've called me to, to be a pastor. But more than that, God, you've called all of us to be a light in this world. And so, Father, may we keep our eyes on you as we're doing that, Lord. It's so hard. It really is hard. And I pray for the strength, God, of every person listening to me now. That as we keep our eyes fixed on the author, the perfecter of our faith, God, that we'd be able to run with endurance and not give up. Lord, I'm so tired of hearing about Christians that give up. Oh, it burdens my heart, God. Just reading recently of a, of a Christian musician named Gunger who wrote the famous song, You Make Beautiful, Thank God, and he's walked away from God and denouncing his faith. And I think, oh, we used to sing that song in church. Why are so many people walking away, God? And I think it might just be because they're looking elsewhere. May we be those that keep our eyes fixed on you, I pray. You know, for just the next one minute, one more minute, would you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed and listen to the words of this song that Sky's gonna sing. You don't have to sing along. Just listen to these words and make it your prayer and I'll close this with a benediction and let's go. Oh, Christ, be the center of our lives be the place we fix our eyes be the center of our life yes if you would actually sing this with me turn your eyes so turn, turn your eyes, eyes upon Jesus, look for in his wonderful face and the things and the things of her will grow straight. Father, thank you for our time together today, and I pray now for these folks that you would bless them, that you would keep them, that you would cause your face to shine on them. Be gracious to them, Lord. Lift up your countenance upon them, and grant to each person listening today your peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen. And love you guys. Have a good Sunday. If you need prayer for any reason, we always hang out afterwards.